Hi, crime junkies. It's Ashley here. And you all know how ready I am at any moment to drop down the rabbit holes of mysterious cases to look for answers. And there's actually one right now that I cannot stop spiraling about with more rabbit holes than I can count. In this season of Counterclock, investigative journalist Delia D'Ambra begins investigating Doug Wag Jr.'s mysterious death after he was found struck on a strip of railroad tracks. But the more Delia has dug into this case, the stranger things have gotten. And you guys, there is truly so much going on. A string of mysterious deaths, a bank robbery gone wrong, conspiracy, corruption, and it may all be connected. You can binge all of Counterclock Season 6 right now in the Crime Junkie Fan Club, or you can listen to new episodes weekly wherever you get your podcasts. Home is your creative canvas, an expression of your unique style. Only Wayfair has everything you need to bring your vision to life. It's the place to shop for everything home. From sofas and beds to dining sets and decor, Wayfair makes it easy with fast and free shipping, even on the big stuff. They'll even help you set it up. Our house is full of Wayfair finds, from wall art to rugs to vases and more. Our go-to is always Wayfair. Every style is welcome in the Waverhood. Visit Wayfair.com or get the Wayfair mobile app. That's W-A-Y-F-A-I-R.com. Wayfair. Every style, every home. Brought to you by the Capital One Venture X Card. Earn unlimited 2X miles on everything you buy and turn everyday purchases into extraordinary trips. Plus, receive premium travel benefits like access to over 1,300 airport lounges and a $300 annual credit for bookings through Capital One Travel. Unlock a whole new world of travel with the Capital One Venture X card. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. Lounge access is subject to change. See CapitalOne.com for details. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, we know you personalize your entire day. That's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. On our last episode, we told you about the strange disappearance of Alyssa Turney. She went missing back in 2001, but it wasn't until a serial killer in Florida falsely confessed to murdering her in 2006 that her case was finally investigated and police, friends, and family came to realize that Alyssa was likely the victim of foul play. It took years for family members to find out that Mike Turney, Alyssa's stepdad, had taken her out of school early the day she went missing. And although he had video surveillance in their home and recorded all incoming and outgoing phone calls, the tapes from the day Alyssa went missing and the call she supposedly made to her stepfather a week later from California could not be produced because they were either taped over or the recording devices were conveniently turned off. Mike became an immediate suspect in many people's minds as his stories changed and new information about his relationship with Alyssa surfaced. For a long time, family members stood by him, including Alyssa's half-sister, Sarah. But in the years since Mike's arrest and his subsequent release from prison for making those 26 pipe bombs, information has come out that has changed Sarah's mind. And now she has become Alyssa's number one champion, advocating for justice and demanding answers from her own father, the man she thinks did something to her sister. myself on the 2020 episode um, now as an adult it's extremely difficult to watch I look so naive and um, it's just really sad I really believed that my father had nothing to do with it and I could never grasp the idea that he could even try to hurt someone Um, so it's extremely difficult to watch now so 
I know you learned a lot in the 2020 special, like you and all of your family did, the stuff that you never knew before. In our last episode, we mentioned how it was the first time anyone in your family knew that Mike Turney had actually picked Alyssa up out of school early that day. But I don't think that was the most shocking thing that we learned from that 2020 special. This was the first time that it also became publicly known that Alyssa had actually been making accusations to people that Mike had molested her, correct? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I found out so much from that 2020, including that she was being sexually molested by him, which was a huge shock to me. I'd never heard that before. Um, I mean, only when the police sat me down and kind of yelled it in my face, but to see um, journalists come to the same conclusion was totally different. Um, But it didn't click all at once, you know. It, It took a while to sink in, and at first I really rejected the TV show, and I was really upset about it, and I thought that they had wronged me, uh, but now I see that they're just pointing to the same conclusion that everyone does. How long had it been going on? Do you know for sure? No, I mean, I don't know for sure. Um, It's hard, because at this point, we're really piecing together letters and piecing together statements, Um, but I want to say, I mean, for years, at least. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you look at the video... um, where uh, the home video I found where Alyssa calls my father a pervert. She was 14 in that video. So you mentioned some letters, um, which I think are important, because when we talked about them raiding your dad's house, looking for evidence against him in Alyssa's disappearance, they end up finding these 26 pipe bombs. But they did end up collecting like tubs of audio tapes and documents. And part of that what like included some letters, correct? Or did you find the letters from someone else? Well, so, I mean, which letters are you referring to? Ones where she was talking about being molested. I know in the um, in the tubs there were some documents, like there were contracts where she had to sign, right, and say that she wasn't molested? Yeah, so sorry. There, there's like, there's so many different documents and uh, statements. Okay. But uh, so it, in the tubs, I believe in the tubs, I don't know if he had these somewhere safe or if it was just thrown in with a bunch of other documents. I really couldn't tell you, but... um. He found, they found contracts where my father had Alyssa sign that she was never sexually molested um, and that, you know, she would follow so many different rules. It was absolutely disgusting. And then, you know, there was another set of letters that a friend came forward with on the podcast um, that talked about being molested. So, I mean, we have multiple pieces of evidence that are pretty strong, I feel. Mm -hmm. And so she wrote these letters to friends, but that wasn't the only time that she tried reaching out for help, right? Like she tried so many different times with so many different people, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, at one point I had um, me and Octavia, the the podcast producer, we share this giant stack of documents that she requested from the city because there's thousands of them and requesting them is so painful that to go through it again just seems crazy. Um, So we share it and I was trying to go through it and find how many people had stated that they knew that she was being molested. And I have this post-it note, and it's almost completely full of names. And I want to say it's, you know, close to 20, 25 people on there that knew, that told the police this after the fact. So, I mean, when they say there's no evidence, I don't know what they mean. Yeah, I mean, 25 people is astonishing. And I know just from that 2020 special, her boyfriend had heard allegations. Um, One of your brothers, right, or stepbrothers had heard allegations some of her friends and you know everyone I guess I can understand people are young they're teenagers but one of the people that stood out the most to me is you had mentioned that a she told a teacher that's correct yeah she told a teacher when I want to say she was nine or ten years old right after her mother passed um so the molestation could have been happening since then but she cried out for help you know to adults and to her peers and to her siblings and nobody helped and it's heartbreaking it really is because it it doesn't seem like something she was trying to hide too hard and like she was looking for help constantly. And, she, you know, she obviously never said anything to you. So you were so shocked by it. Do you think it was something that she was trying to, like, protect you from or, or keep from you because you were so young? I do, yeah. I mean, I think because I was young and that she was trying to protect me. And I don't know, maybe she thought I would have told my dad I was extremely close to my father and extremely loyal to my father, as you can see from my past behavior. And Maybe she was afraid to tell me because I would tell on her, because I told on her all the time. You know, I wasn't a cool little sister. I I was that little sister that told on her all the time, which is, you know, one of my biggest regrets. It's hard. I was very young. But, um, 
yeah, I, I wouldn't have kept that secret, I bet. Now, you mentioned a couple of times um, the podcast, the podcast. We're going to link out to all of that on our website. But there was an entire podcast done by an amazing journalist or investigative journalist in Arizona all about Alyssa's case. And one of the most interesting things that I thought got brought up on that podcast was um, a story from a relative that had come to live with your dad for a while. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. Um, so one of my cousins came forward. He lived with us in the early year, maybe mid nineties. Um, and his story is that, um, when he lived with us, he came home late from a shift at Sam's club or something to that effect. And, um, he popped in a VHS into the the VHS player and it said Dr. Doolittle. And on it, he found pornographic material, um, of two young women naked from the waist up with a newspaper covering their faces and he believes that that person was Alyssa um, and one of his friend, one of her friends that um, he can't remember the name of. At that point he um, turned off the tape, he immediately grabbed all of his things and left and um, he never told my father why. So that's his story. Um, I was very young, I can't confirm really what happened when he left, I don't remember, um, but I remember he did live with us, and I do remember that one day he was kind of just gone. And obviously the other girl has never been identified since, right? Correct, she's never come forward, and I've outright asked some of her friends that I thought thought fit the profile, and no one came forward, um, which of course, I you know, I could understand. It, it would be extremely helpful if they did, but I understand why they wouldn't. You know, you talked about how Knowing what you know now, it changes kind of how you view everything and your relationships and your dad's relationships with people. Do you suspect that your dad may have had an inappropriate relationship with anyone other than your sister? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, my brother's friends have come forward and said that he was extremely creepy and did some really perverted things um, kind of outright. And I also believe that um, it's possible that a friend that was living with me had an inappropriate relationship with him while she was, I gosh, 16 or 17 at the time. Um, they would go to the movies together without me and go to dinner without me, and they were extremely close. And she came from, you know, a pretty bad background and came to our house because it was a better environment. Um, and they were really close, and I was always kind of jealous. You know, I was 16, 17, and I would always tell him, you love her more than me and you treat her better and you buy her more things. And I look back on it now and it just seems kind of gross. Um, I don't speak to that friend anymore. She, we were childhood best friends and she stopped speaking to me. Um, once he went to prison, she just wouldn't contact me any longer. Mm -hmm. It's such a nice perk to have the flexibility to work in all sorts of places. But working on the go seamlessly requires a strong network, which is why you should check out T-Mobile. They're America's largest and fastest 5G network. Plus, they also cover more highway miles with 5G than anyone else. And that's been great for me especially because these last few months, I've been doing a lot of on-the-ground reporting with our team from northern Wisconsin to Utah to the middle of nowhere, Indiana. No matter where I go, I'm able to stream, make calls, or get those case-altering DMs from sources, which that's my favorite part. With T-Mobile, you'll be covered in more places with the 5G speed you need for your life on the go. Find out more at T-Mobile.com slash network today. Coverage not available in some areas. Fastest based on median overall combined 5G speeds, according to analysis by Ookla of Speed Test Intelligence Data Q3 2023. See 5G device coverage and access details at T-Mobile.com. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. If you're anything like me, when you have something weighing on your mind that's taking up time and energy, the best thing you can do is to talk about it. But sometimes that's also one of the hardest things to do, too. We all carry around different stressors, big and small. And when we keep them bottled up, it can start to affect us negatively. Therapy is a safe space to get things off your chest and to figure out how to work through whatever's weighing you down. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Crime Junkie today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P 
dot com slash crime junkie. There were other stories um, that came out in the podcast that I think are very telling in giving background to your father and like his family and kind of where he comes from. Um, there were some other family members saying that there's basically a pattern of incest and molestation with not just Mike, but also his brother. Yeah, that, I mean, that's what they're coming out and saying. I'm not sure. It's not something I heard growing up. Um, it's completely possible, but I I couldn't confirm it for sure. I mean, we know that he did it to Alyssa. At one point in the 70s, I believe, my father was a deputy sheriff in Maricopa County in Arizona. And um, he was at his um, brother's house, my uncle's home, and there was a bunch of children there. And um, he apparently helped cover up the attempted murder of his brother's wife. Um, So allegedly his brother's wife and my father were having an affair. And his brother found out, came in, shot his wife, um, I believe a few times. I'd have to re-listen to my cousin's stories again to tell you for sure. Um, shot her a few times. One of the children did see it firsthand. Um, and then my father went in there and tried to cover everything up. They had all the children. Um, well, they set out all the guns on the back of the truck. They covered it up with blankets and had all the kids sit on top um, and tell them not to talk to the police, apparently. And she almost died, but did not. And um, he, no one was ever charged. I don't believe there were any charges on anyone. And uh, pretty soon after that, my father resigned from being a police officer. Wow. I remember I I just recently re-listened to that episode um, from your cousin. And yeah, her story is crazy because she talks about how, at least from my memory, that um, Mike was almost trying to get the kids out of the house. And she felt like she had walked in and maybe you changed the way he shot her mom or something like that. But it was insane to hear her talk about this years later. And she was the same one that said, you know, there was this pattern of abuse on our side of the family as well. And she's like, I feel like I've blocked a lot of that out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, she tells it so much better than I do. I, and I believe she was, you know, 10 or 12 at the time. So she was at a coherent age. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely insane how far this goes back and how many rabbit holes you can really dive into with how horrible of a man my father is and possibly his brother and the rest of the family. It's It's very scary. So there's obviously this allegation of Mike helping your brother not cover up a murder because your aunt ended up living and she, she didn't want to press charges. She was scared of him. Um, but kind of him helping in this situation, does any part of you think that maybe your uncle helped your dad? Oh yeah, it's absolutely crossed my mind. Um, and I did have another cousin, um, come forward to me. We, we reconnected a few years ago, but lost touch again. Um, just a, a hard family to be in. Um, but one of the first things she said to me when we had reconnected after 10 years was, um, I think my father helped your father kill Alyssa. It was literally one of the first things she said to me. Um, and then, you know, at this point, we're kind of on this cliffhanger with her. She um, said that my uncle James was dying and that um, he had told her some things that she had to tell me and she had to get it off her chest. But then she would never meet me and she would never tell me over the phone. And that was probably two years ago and he hasn't died now. But um, it, it's hard. There's so many people that are afraid of both of our fathers um, that I don't know. I mean, I think it's completely possible. Who do you go to in that type of situation where you need to hide a body or you need help and you need a convenient solution? I mean, he lived, I lived two hours up north on a ton of land. It would have been extremely convenient, a lot closer than Desert Center, California, which is, you know, the, the common place that people think she's buried. And they think that because it was mentioned in his manifesto, correct? Yeah, um, so my father said that there were two men from the union that killed Alyssa, that he later killed those two men also, but that she was buried in Desert Center, California, um, which everybody just keeps going back to, Desert Center, California. But that's, you know, at least four hours away. So you're talking eight hours round trip, doing this extremely quick, and then coming and getting me from school. I just don't see it. Yeah, the timeline doesn't quite add up because if he got Alyssa around 11 at the earliest people say between 11 and 12 even if it's 11 at the earliest and he picks you up likely between 4 30 and 5 so five at the latest you're talking actually six hours yeah i think it was very close yeah it makes more sense that he would have to go somewhere that was two to three hours one way somewhere a a lot closer absolutely um you had mentioned that you thought there was a possibility that maybe she was at what's now like a very big shopping center right yeah um i do it's it's hard. Um, 
because I spent so much time there as a middle schooler. Um, but essentially, in the summer of 2001, there was this very large shopping center being built, an outdoor mall that is, you know, very common in Arizona. So there's a Target and there's a Kohl's and there's a string of small stores in between. Um, so this very large landscape of stores. But um, during that time, like I said, it was being built, you know, lots of holes. Um, and we'd actually spent a lot of time out there. We owned a go-kart and we would always ride right where they were building this shopping center. Um, so I think it's very plausible. It's very close. It's very convenient. How easy would it be to throw her in a pre-existing hole, throw some dirt over it, knowing that in a few weeks it's going to be covered up? Um, you know, and I did a little bit of research into it, you know, and I've been told that um, they do ground penetrating radar before they put these doors in, but it's only before they dig. So if you catch them after they dig, they're not going to search it again. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's, I mean, that's kind of terrifying. I mean, like I, so I used to shop at Desert Ridge Shopping Center all the time when I lived in Phoenix and knowing that she could be there, but literally if she is, there's, there's no answers unless he were to tell you or someone were to tell you, right? I mean, that or ground penetrating radar, if they would just, I don't know exactly how it works, but if we could get in there. Hmm. There was um, something that did come up, though, in Desert Center back in 2013, if I'm remembering correctly, right? I think they found some some kind of remains, but it was, like, very inconclusive on even if they were male or female. Is that correct? Yeah. So a hiker came across some bones in Desert Center, California, and they did test the bones, but it was extremely inconclusive. Like, they, they could get almost nothing um, from it. But um, a few months ago in September, I called and I asked to see if we can get those bones retested um, just to see, you know, if technology had changed in 10 years. Um, and I'm currently awaiting a response from, um, I forget which county it is in California, um, but from their coroner's office. So hopefully they will retest the bones or find them worthy or I don't know what the process is, but um, I'm really hoping to get those retested, you know. Hopefully in 10 years things have changed. Yeah, I'm really interested as well on like, whose decision that is? Is that the coroners? Is that the investigators? Is it, like, who decides what gets retested and when? I'm sure that's not something you have the answer to, but I'd love to actually talk to somebody and find out. I'm trying to, I'm actually going through my mind right now and thinking about, like, I'm working with an investigator. Yeah. Well, they had me originally call the police department, and the police department told me to call the coroner's office. Um, so I'm not sure. I would venture to say there's no, like, set guidelines. It's just somebody has to push it forward, and everyone's kind of, like, passing the buck. Yeah, I mean, when I called, they were certainly really surprised at my request. Um, it didn't seem like something that, that happens a lot, so I'm not sure what they're going to say. It'd be really interesting. Again, I don't know what's available with these remains, or do you know exactly what was found? Was it just bones? Was it just, like, a couple of bones? I'm not sure. I've only heard the term bones. Okay. I mean, with all of like the genealogy stuff now, even if it's, you know, they find that it's not Alyssa, it'd be really interesting if that's something they could use to see who it was. Yeah. Hopefully we can figure out whoever it is. So knowing obviously everything that you do now, there's obviously so much going on in the home that you weren't aware of. What things do you look back on now and see in a totally different light? Oh, goodness. Everything. I mean, literally everything. All the things that I thought he was cool for doing. Um, I look back and just, it's obviously really bad, really bad parenting. And I had so much freedom from such a young age. And I realized that he just didn't care and that that trickled down to Alyssa. He was so overbearing, but it was only to protect himself. Like he, he never cared about his children um, at a certain point. And I mean, everything was, you know, there's new stories about my mother and there's just new things coming out every single day. Um, the way he treated my friends now, I think twice about. The way he treated me, I think twice about. The way he treated the animals, I think twice about. Um, you know, what he was doing, spending all this time alone in our garage and, you know, tinkering and arts and crafts and ordering things from this gun catalog thing that I can't even describe. And we would have 20 packages come every day from this catalog, and I have no idea what he was doing. Um yeah, I mean, I wish I could piece it together and try to figure out where it began and when he started building the bombs and when he started molesting Alyssa. And if I noticed, um, I can't tell if I'm blocking it out or if I just didn't see it. The evidence keeps pouring in. At this point, the facts are undeniable. 
It's an open and shut case. Monopoly Go is the most fun you can have in a mobile game. Everyone is still talking about Monopoly Go for a good reason. It is an absolute hit. Millions of people pass Go every day because this game is always bringing something new to the table. Like countless crazy tournaments you can join with your friends as partners or teams, or timed events offering bonuses like massive multipliers or rent frenzies to help you get huge rewards. And there's so many rewards to discover. Rare stickers you can trade with friends to complete albums, delightful emojis to taunt people with when you raid their riches, unique playing pieces, and so much more. The verdict is in. With Monopoly Go, there's something new to discover every time you play. So don't miss out. Go download it now free on the App Store and Google Play. Pride yourself on finding the best deals and savings? Rakuten is the smartest way to save money when you shop because members get cash back at over 3,500 stores across every category, including fashion, beauty, electronics, home essentials, travel, dining, and more. Your favorite stores like Macy's, Urban Outfitters, and Sephora pay Rakuten a commission for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares the commission with its members. That's you. Cashback is deposited directly into your PayPal account, or Rakuten can send you a check. You can even maximize your savings by stacking cash back on top of other deals, like store sales and coupons. Shop for everything from fashion to beauty, home decor to groceries, even kids' school supplies. You're already shopping at your favorite stores, so why not save while you're doing it? It's a no-brainer. Membership is free, and it's easy to sign up. I love using Rakuten because I truly don't even have to think about it. The app is just there, hanging out and giving me cash back on so many of my normal everyday online purchases. All I have to do is shop. Get the Rakuten app now and join the 17 million members who are already saving. Cashback rates change daily. See Rakuten.com for details. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N dot com. Your cashback really adds up. Does any part of you now think that maybe she could have run away? No. No. There's zero part of me that thinks she could have run away. How do you interpret the note that she left now? Like, do you think she actually wrote it? Any part of it? When she wrote it? Yeah. So I think that note was intended for the day that she spoke with our Aunt Lynette. Um, She had a conversation with her about going out to California to go live with her. Um, And I think that was Alyssa writing it that day and maybe planning to run away. Um, But I don't think she placed it. I think my father found that note. Um, where it says, you know, Dad and Sarah, when you dropped me off at school today, I decided I really am going to California. Um, Sarah, you wanted me gone. Look, now you have it. Dad, that's why I saved my money. Um, and then, Dad, I took $300 from you, Alyssa. Um, I think she wrote it on a different day and that possibly the last line in her name could have been a forced action. Um, it, it's hard and I could be looking into it because I obviously read a lot into all these things and I've just been looking at it for too long. But if you look at the note, the structures of the sentences physically are all very much the same until the last sentence. And it just looks a little bit sloppier. And that's when it says, Dad, I took $300 from you, Alyssa. So the fact that she would have taken $300 is just odd to me because she had saved 1800 as she wrote in her note that she had been saving her money and she didn't take it. And then she writes her name in a style that she never writes her name. She usually uses a very large lowercase as opposed to a capital A. So those two parts are just so strange to me. They just don't make any sense. Um, So I think it could have been a combination of things, but at the very least, she didn't leave the letter for us. I, I totally believe that my father found it and was just kind of struck at the opportunity. It all kind of aligned for him. I was gone on a field trip. He finds this note. He's upset because he knows that she's going to go to California, find an adult she can trust in to finally tell all these things, and that my aunts are so mad that they'll actually do something about it. I think he kind of saw everything fall away in front of him and thought his only opportunity to save his life was to get rid of Alyssa, finally, this burden that he had talked about his whole life. You know, he'd always talked about what a handful she was, what a little pistol she was, you know, outright called her a bitch from a very young age. This was finally his chance to get rid of her and become super dad like he thought he was. So you think it was, if it happened that way, it was likely planned out, maybe not very far in advance, but that it, that when he picked her up, if he did it, he likely knew what he was going to be doing? I believe so, yeah. And it seemed like that's kind of what he did. You know, there's multiple people that came forward with a story about 
my father taking Alyssa out into the middle of the desert and trying to sexually molest her. So I think that was him trying to stage the scene that he was going to do the same thing again so she wouldn't be suspecting but this time he did something different. I know you don't really have a relationship with your dad anymore, but you actually did confront him recently. Like, what questions did you ask him? Oh, I asked him everything, absolutely everything um, about Alyssa. That was my main objective. Um, I asked him if he did it, you know, and he told me he would tell me on his deathbed or that he would tell me if the state gave him lethal injection within 10 days of his statement. So he was mocking me. He was taunting me the whole entire time. He, um... He's 70 years old, and he came on a cane despite having health reports that say he's as healthy as a 45-year-old. Um, he's playing the part. So he came, and he acted soft and, like, you know, I'm so happy to be here and that we can reestablish this relationship. And I told him that's not what I was there for and that I needed to ask him these questions for my own well-being. And because I wanted to hear it from him outside of a prison line for the first time, I'd never spoken to him in a way that wasn't somehow recorded before this. Um and yeah, I just kind of gave it to him and he wasn't ready for that. And he turned from, you know, trying to be comforting and trying to bring me back into his life to shutting me out and getting really aggressive and saying that maybe he should just never see his kids again. And he leaned across the table at me and he talked through his teeth and I wanted to lean back and I just kind of gave it back to him. And I wanted him to know that I'm not afraid of him and I don't respect him. And I see him as nothing. And that's kind of um, a change for you. And it's got to feel really good. I remember you saying that your dad for a long time was very manipulative and would threaten suicide or saying you're better off without him. And it's kind of like what he used to control you for a lot of years. Oh, absolutely. I mean, every day he would tell me that he was going to go run away to a cave because his kids didn't love him. I mean, from a very young age, um, you know, he'd say maybe he just won't come back. And I remember... Like, I would have the biggest guilt if I didn't give my dad a hug and a kiss on the cheek before I left for school or before he left for wherever because I thought genuinely that would be the last time I would see him. Um, and that's also why I stayed home from school two to three days a week. I mean, I missed half of my school days um, from sixth grade until I dropped out on my first day of senior year um, because I was genuinely afraid that he would leave and never come back and that I would have nothing. You know, I had already lost my mother. I had already lost my sister. My brothers weren't around. He's all I had. And he, in my eyes, had always treated me so good, you know? If I wanted money to go to the mall, here it was. If I wanted my boyfriend to move in, sure, why not? If I wanted beer because I was, you know, a, a sad teenager, then why not? Have all your friends over. Have a party. I'll buy the beer. You want money for the mall? No problem. You want to go to the Rocky Horror Picture Show at 1 a.m. at Chris Town in a dangerous part of Phoenix? You go for it. You just be happy. Um, so I thought he was looking out for me and that he loved me and that he wanted me to be happy. And little did I know, all this time, he was the one causing pretty much everything terrible in my life. It's a beautiful moment. Your baby is taking their first steps and then comes the not-so-beautiful moment. Blowout, diaper leakage, messy stuff where you really don't want it. Thankfully, this can all be avoided with a parent's must-have diaper, Pampers Cruisers 360. Pampers Cruisers 360 have up to 100% leak-free fit. The blowout barrier in the back helps prevent leaks no matter how active, on the go, or wild your baby moves. Josie pretty much skipped crawling, and the girl is now full-on running. And Pampers Cruisers 360 has saved me from some very massive, messy situations. So as soon as your baby starts standing or walking, get them in Pampers Cruisers 360. Because unlike other diapers, there are no diaper tabs. Instead, they have a stretchy 360-degree waistband that you can pull on so easily. Add Pampers Cruisers 360 and free and gentle wipes to your cart or pick them up at your local grocery store or big box store. For trusted protection, trust Pampers, the number one pediatrician recommended brand. The weather's getting warmer, so it's time to say goodbye to jackets and sweaters and hello to shorts and tees. 
If you've been wanting to update your wardrobe for the long haul without spending a fortune, Quince is for you. Build up a lineup of timeless pieces that keep you looking effortlessly chic year after year. Like premium European linen dresses, blouses, and shorts from $30, washable silk tops, timeless 14 karat gold jewelry, and so much more. And the best part? All Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, Quince cuts out the cost of the middleman and passes those savings on to you. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes. You all know I love my cashmere pieces from Quince and Ashley can't get enough of their bodysuits, but I have two words, washable silk. I can't get enough washable silk dresses, skirts, and blouses from Quince, and I used to like save silk for special occasions, but since these are washable silk, I'm wearing silk like every day. Get warm weather ready with Quince. Go to quince.com slash crime junkie for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash crime junkie to get free shipping and 365 day returns. Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash crime junkie. You mentioned that, you know, part of the reason you were so attached to the idea of him being a good guy is he was all that you had left. But I know all of this opening up has like brought up so much more than you expected. And you've even been asked to reconsider what you thought you knew about your mom's death. Is that right? Yeah. um, So it's hard. Um, I've had people come to me and say, my aunt specifically, she came and she said basically that she thought that my father killed my mother um, with a morphine overdose. And what I know is real is that my mother died one day before her life insurance policy was about to lapse. That is completely true. We have those records. Um, and she did have she did have cancer. She, she was dying, correct? The, um, the theory that your aunts have is just it was very convenient time at how quickly it happened. Yes, exactly. She was dying of cancer, of lung cancer. She wanted to die at home with all of her children. Um, and for those last few, I don't know if it was months or weeks, I'm really not sure. Um, you know, she was uh, apparently afraid that he, she, he was overdosing her. Um, but I don't know, my aunt promised to show me these letters and I haven't seen them yet. So I'd really love to see them. Um, cause I've told so many different things and I've been wrong in the past, obviously. And, um, as much evidence as I can get, I'll take. So I, I'd love to see those letters before I jump to a conclusion. But again, it's, it's very strong evidence to me about her dying one day before this life insurance policy. It seems very convenient. Do you think, how well, how old were you and Alyssa when your mom passed away? Um, so I was four and Alyssa was nine. And nine was about the time that she went to her teacher, correct? Correct. Do you think the abuse started before or after your mom's passing or, or when she got sick? I don't know. I mean, it could have been before. Um, there are documents that my mother took Alyssa to get examined for um, for rape or, I, I mean, sexual misconduct, whatever. They, she had an exam done, essentially. Um, and I believe it came back um, negative. But so she obviously had some kind of suspicion. Right. Interesting. And did your mom have an autopsy done when you know, when she passed? Or, I mean, obviously she couldn't request it, but was one done? No, there wasn't, and that's extremely strange to me also um, because my father is very much the person that wants to know why and how things happened, and he likes documentation, and he had planned on suing the tobacco industry for leaving all these children, you know, without a mother. Um, He'd always talked about that, so why wouldn't you go with this autopsy in hand that says cigarettes and lung cancer killed this woman? Do you know... Like, w- what investigative measures are being taken by police now? Are they even considering prosecuting the case against your father? Because I know he's he's out now for his past crimes and just and like living a normal life, right? Yeah, I mean, he's a free man in downtown Phoenix, as far as I know. Um, but at this point, the police are open to accepting leads and tips, but they are not actively investigating it. Um, I am in the process of requesting my old detectives back because I've found some um, miscons- um, some inconsistencies in the police story, and so I'm trying. To, I'm trying to figure out what they're doing because it's it's not in the way of prosecution. Um, and I was told one story, and now something else completely is happening. So it's kind of a tricky story with the police right now. But um, they are not pursuing prosecution in in any way, and they just say that they need a body. 
but they also won't search for this body. And they tell me to get media attention, and then they won't help in media attention. So I think they just kind of want me to go away at this point. But you're not going away? No, never. And I've made that quite clear. If what they're looking for is a body, did they say why they won't search for a body? No. They won't give me really any answers. Um, I've asked if I can raise money to give them to search for a body, and they said no. Interesting. So what do you hope to gain for media attention to just put, you know, like their feet to the fire? Because I know you have this petition, right? You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. um, So I have a petition um, for my father to be prosecuted for this crime, for him to go to trial. All I want is a fair trial. And right now, my only chance is media attention. We have to get enough people to care about Alyssa because right now, there's no pressure on them. The police won't listen and they don't care anymore. Um, So they told me to get media and that's what I'm going to do and I'm not going to stop until they actually present this case for prosecution. They haven't even tried to present it to the district attorney's office. They just say that it's going to fail. But I need everybody to kind of scream that at them for them to listen because they won't listen to me. How many signatures do you think you need to get their attention? So right now I have about 40,000 signatures. And what's really, really sad is I saw the sister of another missing girl go to the district attorney's office with 40,000 signatures, paper signatures that she rallied for for weeks. She goes down there and they just don't blink an eye at it. They don't care. So my goal is 500,000, which sounds really ambitious, but I think it's a number that might start to get their attention. Is Octavia still investigating this? I mean, she's got her podcast. We're going to give all that information at the end. So people definitely need to go listen. The story is twisted and there's so many details she has. She has an interview, multiple interviews with you, interviews with Alyssa's friends, interview, um, an interview with your father that she finally got. Um, so that is a wealth of information that I think people need to check out. But is she actively investigating or is it has, has it kind of even stalled for her because she feels like, oh my gosh, we have everything we need and now we need police to take it from here? Yeah, I mean, she's still continuing to put out episodes, but it's mostly people coming forward with new information. You know, she's requested every document that exists out there, so I think she's really exhausted the resources that are already existing. Um, and she just continues to put out new episodes about things that come up. Do you think, I don't know the laws in Arizona, and I'm not sure if you do either, but would it change anything if someone were to come forward and say, you know, what he was doing to Alyssa, he did to me when I was underage? Um, If somebody were to come forward with that, does that change anything? Or is it too late, if you know? No, I mean, I don't know the exact laws, but I think it would help get the ball rolling for sure. If other people came forward and said, no, he's done this to me also, and he needs to pay. You know, people have to listen. You can't just let these things happen for years or to so many women. It's not right. Do you think there's anything um, that I missed in the questions that we went over that you think is important for people to know? I mean, just that I need help and I can't do it alone. That's really all I want to stress. And I've been trying to do this for, you know, years and years and years. And I need more than just my voice to get to the police. Crime Junkies, Sarah needs your help. She is only one person fighting an uphill battle for her sister. Like I said in part one, if you had an hour of time to listen to both of these episodes, you owe it to Sarah to take two minutes to sign the petition to help get her sister justice. You can do that by going to crimejunkiepodcast.com, click on the episodes button, and you will find the petition in the blog about Alyssa's episode. This was not a story done for entertainment. Alyssa is missing. We need our Crime Junkie family to band together and actually help when given the opportunity. And if you'd like to hear my interview with a real-life prosecutor, Carly Shoemaker from Iowa, you can go to patreon.com slash crimejunkie for that. She gives us insight into why she thinks the case hasn't been prosecuted so far and what she thinks it would take to bring this case to trial. When you sign up, you'll also get all of our bonus episodes. And if you need a little pick-me-up after this episode, make sure to stay tuned after the credits for our Prep It of the Month.
This episode of Crime Junkie was researched, written, and hosted by me. All of our editing and sound production was done by David Flowers, and all of our music, including our theme, comes from Justin Daniel. Crime Junkie is an audio Chuck production. So what do you think, Chuck? Do you approve? Ashley. Inyaki. Ashley. <laughs> yes. Yes. Are you ready for Property of the Month? Yes. So I've been waiting all month. <laughs> so as you know, I was super, super, super excited about this one. And I told you, I was like, the next one will be this one as long as his mom emails me back. Yeah, you've been like telling me about this one and I have been waiting. Oh, I'm so excited. So today we are telling the story of the puppet named Inyaki. Inyaki. Which I had to practice a lot to say. Uh, not even you practicing. Right before we got on recording, you had to like pull up pronouncenames.com. <laughs> Again, Inyaki's mom sent me that link. <laughs> she was like, you're going to have trouble with this. Yeah. And the guy's like, Inyaki, Inyaki. <laughs> um, because it's a Basque name, which is super cool. So the main reason I've been really excited about this is because it is our first international <gasps> prophet. Oh my God. I'm, I'm like ready for this. Okay. So this is... Uh, prophet story starts in the Spanish city called Segovia. And one morning, Inyaki's mom was heading to work on the bus and she saw through the window a short-legged dog trying to reach something hanging from a garbage can. Oh my God. He was super dirty, looked hungry, and she felt pity for him. And she got off on the next bus stop and went back to see if he was still there. I would so Even- do that. Even though she was already late for work. (laughs) And he was nowhere to be seen. And after a couple of minutes, she decided to just run for it and go back to work, hoping not to be late, but without a profit. About a week later, she kind of ran into her coworker and his girlfriend. And she was carrying the same dog that... (gasps) She had seen at the dumpster a couple days earlier. Is it like a very distinctive dog? How'd she know? Uh, we'll get to that later. But she, she just know when you know, you know. I get it. You like look in their eyes and you know. Yeah, right. You know, you know. And it's not a super big city. And she felt it was a huge coincidence that this girl was just carrying this dog she had just seen. Right. Right. And she asked where she had found him, and she was like, oh, like, I just adopted him from the shelter. I'm taking him to my grandma. Her dog just passed away, and she needed the company. And Nyaki's mom felt happy for the dog, but kind of sad because she wanted him so badly. The next week, she had the same shift as the girl's, this girl's boyfriend, and she was like, hey, how's that dog doing? And... The guy was like, well, like, <gasps> Grandma returned Malachias. Awful. Which was his name at the time, um, to the shelter because he had escaped from her house. And when he returned hours later, he was super dirty and his hair had, like, all this dried Aww. tar and mud. And the grandma was like, I can't handle a dog who won't behave and took him back. So Zimi, Nyaki's mom... After her shift, went straight to the shelter and was like, I am going to get this dog. So they were closed over her lunch break, but she was like, I'm going to hang out. We're going to do this. (laughs) And there was like a security guard there and... He was like, well, why are you here? And she's like, well, I want this I want this dog. I'm here to, to pick adopt. up my soulmate. Duh. You, right. I'm here to adopt Malachias. And she kind of described him. And this is how she described him. He's kind of yellow colored with coarse, long hair, has eyes like black marbles. And this is like a kicker for me. His lower teeth stick out from his <laughs> From his mouth. Oh my god. Um, and he has brown piggy like ears. I did not wait to see this guy. Uh, oh, you're gonna love it. I'll, I, I'm gonna get ready to forward it to you. Um, <laughs> and even though he's medium sized, he has these super short, stunted legs that he looks small, you know? And so the, the security guard goes into the rescue and he's like, 
there is no dog by this description. Excuse me? And she was like, oh, gosh, like, uh, really? Like, I, I miss this dog once. I miss this dog twice. Is there a chance that I actually miss this dog a third time? But she was there and she was like, you know what? I'm just going to get a dog, <laughs> which is like, girl, I identify. Yeah. So she's like, I'll take anything. I'll take any dog you have. <laughs> That's like <laughs> very. I just love this so much. Yeah, just like, just give me a dog. I came here for a dog. I'm not walking out with a dog. You have to have one in there. Just let's see what you got. And and here is like where like she is so much one of us. She's like, I, I'm going to get a dog. I'm going to get a dog. I'm here. But I know if I go in, I'll cry. Oh, I, I, I can never go in. Seven. So just bring me the ugliest dog you have. Oh, that's what she said. <laughs> that's what she said. Um, the one that no one would. Want. Oh, I love her. And when the security guard came back, you know who he had? It was not him. It was him. It was <gasps> not Caius. And she recognized him immediately. And even though they had buzzed him probably because of all the tar it was him of course. when the workers at the shelter got back they confirmed that it was the same dog with all his long hair cut mm-hmm. off and that the vet said he was around two years old and they drew up the adoption papers right there oh my god that is the most heartwarming <laughs> how long have they been together do you know okay so he was about two years old when she adopted him and Inyaki, which is his new name, turned 18 this year. Stop it. They've been together forever. Yeah. And even though he was super naughty when she first got him and liked eating her socks, which Zimi also noted that he then pooed um, (laughs) and he loves stealing food. He's very mature and independent and wise. Of course he is. And she eventually left Signovia and obviously he went with and... Uh, since then, Zimi and her husband have fostered more than 20 cats and dogs, Aww. even chickens. Aww. And Yaki has been super supportive and kind to all of them, even though he was kind of curious and annoyed towards cats. No one can tell he's 18 years old, even though he's deaf and has had two tumors removed from his neck four years ago. Are you kidding me? Besides that, he's a lot of vitality. He loves running and looks super youthful. And Zimi wishes he would live 18 years more. And Zimi, so do we. He will. (laughs) He will. He will. We have no proof that dogs aren't eternal. Yeah, they're immortal. (laughs) I've, that's like, I know this. I have to believe this. (laughs) We've talked about this before. Okay, where are these freaking pictures? Okay, give me just a second. So, Inyaki also has uh, some rescue brothers and sisters. Dahlia. Oh my god. Who is a French basset griffin. And Sete, I think. I can see his little two first. The English here. setter. And also some cats, <laughs> Negu, Mog, and Toscana. And Mog especially loves cuddling with him. Oh, where do they live now? It's beautiful. Oh my god, this picture of him in black and white with the tefers oh i know he's got the best he looks tifers so in the world serious that is like an emo picture I, oh my god i love the one he's of him just like sitting on like the sidewalk with the rocks no there is one where it's like straight up sound of music oh no he's I like see, oh isn't that the best they're like on the a hill. hills are alive the hills are <laughs> effing alive with the sound of inyaki Inyaki. I yeah. love him and all of his siblings. <laughs> I just started. Oh my god, he is so cute. She's totally right. He's got brown ears. Like his ears are very dark brown. The rest of him is very light. And he has like the little jaw. He has piggy ears. Like his oh her description was spot on. Oh yeah. And look at him just trompsing on the beach. Are these pictures for real? Like, where is this place? Like, seriously, like, I, I want to say she, like, faked these images because they're so beautiful. So they are currently in Euskadi, which is Basque country, I believe, in Spain. Okay, well, I'm moving. <laughs> and I would like to also point out that even though Inyaki's mom, Zimi, has never been interested in true crime before. She's addicted to the podcast, binge listened yes. in a week, yes. and loves us both. So, oh, Zimi, thank you, you so much for Inyaki's story. We loved it. I can't wait to show everyone Inyaki's adorableness because, again, when you sent the pictures, I lost my 
mind. I mean, these are the most like photogenic pictures. Like, I, yeah, again, Brit, post all of these on the website. I love them. And I'm moving to Spain. So we're going to have to like work out our new schedules to tape Crime Junkie. <laughs> okay. See you from Spain. <laughs> see you from Spain. <laughs> Bluebell Cookie Two-Step is made with rich, creamy vanilla ice cream and bits of brown sugar, chunks of chocolate cream-filled cookies, and tasty chocolate chip cookie dough pieces. When it comes to boot scooting, we don't fiddle around. Available in pints and half gallons, Cookie Two-Step will have your taste buds heading for the dance floor. If you can't find it, ask your favorite grocer. Want the same expert advice you get from the pros in the store while shopping online at DiscountTire.com? Meet Treadwell, your personal online tire guide that matches you with the perfect tire for your vehicle. Get your best match in one minute or less with Treadwell by Discount Tire. Let's get you taken care of.